Anyway, I was there for internship and residency. Um, now, it was during the residency that um, I learned that there was more than, much more than I had um, been taught in medical school. A woman came in who was having really bad leg cramps. They were hurting her a lot. And of course, uh, one always reads the medical record beforehand to see what, it, what, can be, what had been done so far. She'd made several visits about this, That's, so I read it. And she had had every treatment, both patent medicines and then calcium and things like that, and nothing had worked. So um, I didn't know what I could do for her. I was new. But I asked, well, what's on your mind today? What can I do for you? She says, well, you saw the treatments that I've taken, and I'm still having leg cramps. And I said, yes. She says, well, I want to know if vitamin E can kill me. And I said, um, no. One of the few things I learned about in medical school is that nobody ever died of vitamin E. And why do you ask? And she says, well, FDA says all those fat-soluble vitamins are going to kill us, and I want to make sure I can take it without hazard. Well, why would you take vitamin E? She pulls a book out of her purse, and she says, says right in here that sometimes vitamin E takes care of leg cramps that nothing else will touch. And I said, well, I didn't know that. Can I look at that book for a moment? And she says, sure, gave me the book. And it was by a nutrition expert by the name of Adele Davis. It was not by a medical doctor or any kind of doctor at all. And of course, I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Show me where in the book it says that. So she did. And Adele Davis was very good at putting in footnotes to, to validate what she was claiming. So, I asked her, do you mind if I photocopy this page? And I did. Um, she says, no, not at all. She says, besides, now that I know vitamin E won't kill me, I'm going to go home and try it right away. Okay. Now, I'm not sure if she was really there because of herself or if she was sent to teach me something. Mm -hmm. Because I never saw her again. As far as I'm aware, the next couple of years I was there, she didn't come back to the clinic. And yet... The medical assistant for the residents got a call to relay a message to me that she'd taken that vitamin E, and after a month she wasn't having any more leg, leg cramps, and they had stayed away for the next two months. The call didn't come in for a couple, three months, as you can hear. So I pulled out that photocopied page and decided the next opportunity I'd go to the University of Washington Library and look that up. And, oh my goodness, there was an article on about vitamin E and leg cramps. Nobody had ever taught me that. Very fortunately, I also got the name of the book. So I went and bought me one, and it was full of footnotes to things that are in the medical journals but had never been taught in school because it was all about vitamins and minerals and a few botanicals and things like that. And every one of them was footnoted so that I could go look them up, which was very nice of her. And that's what got me started thinking, oh, there really is another path here, and I can either use it concurrently, or depending on how far this path goes, hey, maybe we don't have to use nearly as many of those patented medicines. Now, patent medicines are what many people term uh, for what are sometimes called pharmaceuticals. By the way, if you look up the origin of the word pharmaceutical, it has something to do with the word poison, so that's another story. Um, anyway. And patent medicines, in order to patent it, they cannot occur in nature. So they must be molecules that do not exist in nature. And my thought, after reading through Adele Davis's book, is, oh my goodness, what are we doing putting all these molecules into people that never before occurred on planet Earth? We shouldn't be doing that. As far as we know, humanity was either created or evolved, whichever we believe in, on this planet. And what we should be using are molecular substances that belong on the planet and therefore have been tolerated by humans, hopefully, um, that's where we should be. So I started doing more and more reading on it, and then uh, after the residency I was assigned to one of the several group health clinics. Um, this one was in Renton, Washington, and 
A fellow came in who had a diabetic leg ulcer. You know, unfortunately, people who have diabetes get ulcers much more easily. And he had an ulcer on, the, on him, one of his ankles about the size of a 50% piece. Now, I had read his record, too, and he had had, once again, nearly every medical procedure there is, including skin grafting, to try to cover up that ulcer. And no, none of it had worked. Now, since I had read Adele Davis's book and got and collected some of the articles, I'd put my nickels into the photocopier and photocopy the articles up at the University of Washington because I couldn't get them any other way. Um, anyway, since I'd read that, no less an outfit than the Cleveland Clinic, which we've all heard about. The Cleveland Clinic had made some publications about how zinc helps to heal things that won't heal, the mineral zinc. All right. So, again, I read through his record. He'd had all these procedures. I said, why don't you go on down to your health food store and get yourself some zinc? And it's safe up to this amount. I had checked that. And he did. And, oh, my goodness, he came back. He didn't call back. He came back and showed me that his ulcer was gone. That was six months later. But even so, it was gone. Wow. Now, I got called on the carpet for that. The chief of the clinic who was a doctor who had been in practice for a while, called me into his office. I thought I knew what it was going to be about, so I took in a couple of those photocopied articles from the Cleveland Clinic, thought maybe it might impress him, you know, and uh, went in and he says, I want to know what you did for Mr. So-and-so. I said, well, his chart's on your desk. You could <clears throat> sir, read about it. He says, that's not what I'm talking about. You use something that isn't approved here at Group Health. He was sounding like FDA, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. I said, but, sir, the ulcer is cured. He said, if it isn't approved, you can't use it. Right then, I knew I was in the wrong spot. Mm -hmm. So... Shortly thereafter, I resigned and went and started my own clinic, which happens to be named <clears throat> Tahoma Clinic. Tahoma is the Native American name for um, Mount Rainier. Um, and somehow it got called Tacoma for the city of Tacoma, but they originally called it Tahoma. So I started the clinic there. I just started it in Kent. I made sure, by the way, and my wife makes fun of me for this, I made sure to check to make sure there were no MDs for five miles in any direction from my office. Because at that way, I wouldn't be seen as as much competition using natural stuff. And I barely heard of naturopathic medicine at that time. So, but even so, I knew they wouldn't appreciate what I was doing any more than the head of the clinic that told me I could only use approved stuff would appreciate it. So anyway, it was five miles in all directions. And sure enough, I got really lucky. No complaints came in about me until I could afford an attorney to defend myself. <laughs> so um, I practiced there by myself. We moved to another location in Kent. And about that time, I got a telephone call from a, a, a recent graduate of the University of Maryland Medical School. This was, by the way, late 70s now, um, uh, by the name of Alan Gaby. And Dr. Gaby, um, he wanted to know, because he'd... Oh, He'd read some of my stuff that was published in Prevention Magazine. I was originally there, um, publishing once a month on something, some natural medicine topic and what you can do about it. He'd read that, and he wanted to come out and be at my office for a while and do some practice and see what he could learn. And I'm surely glad he did, because that man, Dr. Gaby, is an even better library hound than me. Yes, and when he wasn't practicing, he was always up at the University of Washington Library. Me, I had some small kids at the time. I didn't get a chance to go as often as I'd want to. And as we all know, the internet now makes it a lot easier to find things online, such as the National Med Library of Medicine and so forth, but that wasn't there in the late 70s. Um, so he was with me for two years and uh, you know, contributed a lot, found a lot of research we could both use, and then he went back to Maryland um, his family was there, and he had no family out here, so he went back. Now, I had had a lot of education at medical school in obstetrics and gynecology. So one of the things that helped me in the early days of my practice to get going, which again was 70s, uh, I quit group health 
as they officially call themselves, I quit Roof Health in 73 or 74 and went to start my own clinic. And one of the things that helped me a lot is it became known that I had a lot of obstetrics and gynecology background. And so, um, unfortunately, the midwife in our area had moved away and there were no other midwives locally. So I was approached by some of the women who still preferred home deliveries and they asked me if I could help deliver their babies at home. And I said, no, you deliver them, I'll just make sure it's safe. You know, now maybe I'll catch it, but you got to deliver it. Uh, so I said, sure, let's do that. Uh, I can do that because I wasn't really super busy starting with starting a practice. So I did that between um, mid-70s and very early 80s, maybe 80, 81, when I got busy enough that I couldn't take the time overnight to go catch somebody's baby in the middle of the night. And fortunately, another midwife moved to the area so she could take over those who wanted home deliveries. But I learned a lot like that. For example, uh, I found an article, and I found this one, not Dr. Gaby, even though he outdid me at that. Uh, and there's an article in a prominent medical journal, the American Obst Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, that told us about women with nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. And in that study, there was something like 74 women, all but four of whom got rid of their nausea and vomiting in pregnancy within three or four days with a combination of vitamins as C and vitamin K, a particular form of vitamin K. And to this day, sir, Whenever I read in a medical journal, such as the New England Journal of Medicine, the AMA Journal, or the Lancet, a major medical journal, and we do read this from time to time, they publish articles about, here's all the information we have about nausea and vomiting pregnancy. And they keep lamenting, even to this day, that there's nothing reliable. So I send each of these publications an email, because they don't take letters anymore, uh, on paper anyway. Uh, and the email is always titled American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology because that will catch their attention. And I tell them about this, uh, this work by Dr. Merkel, that was his name, M-E-R-K-E-L, and I tell them that not only did it work for him, but it's worked for me every time it's tried. It worked for him 70 out of 74, it worked for me every time. I said, why don't you um, maybe publish about Dr. Merkel and every publication, it's been three of them so far, has sent back a very polite letter saying that they don't have time, space in their medical journals to publish even my letter. And my letter, I always made sure it was less than 150 words, so it wouldn't be very, very long, but they just simply refused to publish that there is a remedy for nausea vomiting pregnancy that works within three days on 70 of 74 women. They wouldn't publish it. That is something that unfortunately still exists, is that bias in what is called uh, mainstream medicine, or standard of care medicine is an even funner term that they use, considering the standard of care for, for nausea and vomiting pregnancy. Mm -hmm. uh, they just won't even consider this stuff. It's really sad. In addition to reading Adele Davis's book, I started looking for other sources of information on natural medicine. Uh, at, at that time, there weren't that many. And I basically tripped over um, a copy of Prevention Magazine, which at that time was run by J.I. Rodale, that's the name, um, and was entirely full of natural medicine information. Now, that's no longer the case, but it was back then. Um, so, I thought, well, what the heck? Um, I know how to write, and so I wrote off a couple of sample articles and sent them off to the editor-in-chief of Prevention Magazine, who very politely and nicely asked me to write them a monthly letter about, um, a monthly article, I'm sorry, about something. And so um, that happened, namely once a month in Prevention Magazine, until, unfortunately, J.I. Rodale either died or lost control of the company. I forget which it was, I don't know. And at that point, uh, they politely told me they didn't want me anymore. And guess what started appearing in Prevention Magazine? Articles for things that weren't entirely, uh, not articles, I'm sorry, advertisements for things that weren't entirely natural. So it's just as well I didn't write for them anymore. Uh, now, after that though, I started uh, my own little newsletter called Nutrition and Healing. And that grew um, by the early 2000s from the 80s 
it grew to over 100,000 subscribers. But, darn it, I would not promote all the products they wanted me to promote. Well, you know, in some of these newsletters, here comes a whole bunch of advertisements for vitamins and minerals and so forth. And I wouldn't promote most of them because I didn't think they were optimal. I want to promote stuff that's optimal for people's health, not just something that, mm, it's okay. Well, they decided I shouldn't write the magazine anymore. I mean, the newsletter anymore because of that. So after that, I started another newsletter, which I still have going. It's called Green Medicine Newsletter. And I know this is an advertisement. In case somebody wants to find it, it's www.greenmedicinenewsletter.com if anybody wants to look it up ever, anywhere. Um, it has one good feature. It has an archive, which means that everything that's been published in there, you just go to wherever the archive thing is, search, and you put in the word you're looking for, like a di diabetes or whatever it may be, and if it's ever been published, the newsletter comes up. And while I'm doing these advertisements, I also do a radio show. I've done so since 2010. It's been on um, the radio. It's called KVI Radio. Uh, every Saturday from noon to two, and that's every Saturday when I'm, in, when I'm in town, which is most of them, and other doctors at our clinic here sub for me when I'm out. And so what we're really trying to do with both the newsletter and the radio show is simply get the word out about well-researched natural things that can help your health, and that we do not need to be putting those molecules into our bodies that don't belong on planet Earth, which is what they have to be to get patented. Mm -hmm between myself and Dr. Gaby, and now uh, Tahoma Clinic and Meridian Valley Lab, with which is associated with Tahoma Clinic, we actually employ a full-time researcher online into the archives of the e medical, of medical school at the University of Washington, etc. So I personally and Dr. Gaby together have a collection of over 100,000 medical journal articles Approximately the first 50 to 60,000 were photocopied because we didn't have any other sources at that time. But the rest of them are now in what's called, as we all know, PDF form. So what we're doing can be very definitely backed up by medical journals. There's a whole tractor trailer full of the paper on paper ones near my home. And the rest of them, we have a, what do they call it, a terabyte storage. And on there is all the rest of them in PDF form. So. There's definitely science behind all of this, even though it's natural.